So again, my name is Pat Smith, I'm president of the Lyme Disease Association, and I want to thank you all for coming today. About the Lyme Disease Association, we are a national nonprofit. we've been in existence for 21 years. Um, we raise research for prevention, education, I'm sorry, dollars for prevention, education, research, and patient support. And uh, what's significant is we're all volunteer organization with no employees. 96% of our revenues that we collect go directly to our programs. Um, with our partners in Connecticut, we helped establish the Columbia Lyme and Tick-Borne Diseases Research Center. Um, we've been part of the combined federal campaign for seven, uh, tw um, for 2012 and for the past seven years. We are partners with the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, a GuideStar member. We have uh, 41 other organizations that we have a relationship with that we work with across the country. Um, last year, I testified before the US House of Representatives Global Health and Human Rights Subcommittee. Um, and so that's a little bit about us. Uh, now, the kind of research we fund, we, we like to think that we fund high quality research that goes on to be published. And to date, we have had uh, publications of research we funded in 29 uh, medical journals. We think that's a pretty good uh, statistics. And uh, we have funded institutions across the country um, for their, with their, uh, the, the projects that they have. And I just thought it would be interesting to look at the first uh, study that we funded that was published, because this is often cited, was actually early work on PCRs, showing that um, antibiotic-treated uh, patients uh, who were treated over an extended period of time, 72, which was 74%, were found positive PCR. Uh, and the rest had negative PCR, and these 62 healthy volunteers were PCR negative. So I think that's one of the uh, significant works that is often used to show that, uh, that something happening and DNA is continuing to exist in patients even after treatment. Uh, the most recent publication we've had is in Northeastern Naturalist, and that was this year, and actually it's in uh, Vermont, a researcher in Vermont, and doing uh, work on finding out what the ticks are there, the percentage of deer ticks carrying the bacteria, which was 9%. And what I found to be interesting, didn't know it at the time, but that basically the latitude of the study, the northern latitude of the study in Vermont, is pretty much the same as the northern latitude of where we are here today in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and I'm sure that uh, Ellen Stormdahl is going to talk about 
ticks and infections uh, uh, in this area. Uh, we have a number of other studies on genomes, on biofilms, uh, and uh, on the uh, neurologic manifestations of Lyme disease. Um, and one I just want to mention, because a lot of times I hear from uh, patients and physicians that they see, especially children, that have appear to have symptoms in the GI tract related to uh, Lyme disease or other tick-borne diseases. And this was a study showing, uh, indeed, that uh, using PCR that this uh, physician was able to uh, demonstrate that there indeed was a DNA in the uh, gastrointestinal tract. Uh, that's just the Columbia opening back in 2007. This is our 14th annual meeting, our first in the Midwest. We were very happy to come here because uh, we know the numbers of cases here are, have become staggering. Um, so we're happy to be here today. Um, good morning, you all. I'm Ellen Strandall, and I'm going to speak today on DOD efforts to prevent tick-borne disease with an emphasis on ticks from military installations in the upper Midwest. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, thanks to Paul and Corey. Next slide, please, Corey. Um, Army entomologists have done tick surveillance in the U.S. for a long time. Before Lyme disease was discovered in the mid-1970s, tick-borne disease was mostly Rocky Mountain spotted fever, tularemia, babesiosis. Um, but as concern about Lyme in military populations grew in 1991, the predecessor of my agency, the Public Health Command, which was called the U.S. Army Environmental Health Agency, was named the DOD lead agent for Lyme disease. Next slide, please. And this is the regulation that in 1991 mandated the Public Health Command to provide the DOD Lyme disease program and other tick-borne disease programs. And then back to the timeline. And then in 1992, the program where I work, the Human Tick Test Kit Program, was initiated. And also in 1992, the Lyme Disease Association was formed. Next slide, please. So um, this program, the Human Tick Test Kit Program, is operated from the lab where I work in the Proving Ground, Maryland. We receive ticks from humans, military personnel, DOD civilians, and dependents. We identify them and test them using molecular techniques for their species-associated pathogens. And the program is voluntary and free of charge. Okay, back to the timeline one more time. Since, um, since this human tick test kit program was initiated in 1992, um, we've added assays for anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis, babesiosis, rickettsiosis. Um, we're also seeking to add assays for the viral pathogens, Powassan, and there are two new viruses of interest from the Lone Star Tick. There's Homeland virus and Deer Tick virus. Next slide, please. We provide this tick testing service because tick-borne disease risk, tick-borne disease is an occupational health risk for soldiers training in the field and to civilians and dependents who live and work on military installations. This photo was taken on a typical summer day just behind my lab in perfect tick habitat with the tick hosts present. We receive about 3,000 ticks per year from around 100 DOD installations. This map shows the locations and the big white edge dots indicate the installations that send us the most ticks. Uh, notice the dot in Wisconsin and that's Fort McCoy and in Minnesota is Camp Ripley. I was pleased to accept the invitation from LDA to speak here in Minnesota this year because Camp Ripley sends in Exodi scapularis with consistently, each year, the greatest prevalence of infection of all the locations mapped here. Over the years, we've, we've received and identified and tested more than 40,000 ticks from the locations that we mapped on the previous slide. Um, U.S. Army tick surveillance plays an important role in treating, in tracking the populations of ticks and their pathogens. 
And we received a nice compliment from Dan Strickman, who's National Program Leader for Veterinary, Medical, and Urban Entomology at the USDA. He said, there's no one else in the country doing surveillance on ticks biting humans like the Human Tick Test Kit Program. Most of the ticks we receive from humans are either Amblyoma americanum, the lone star tick, Dermacinter variabilis, which you guys out here call the wood tick, I think. It's a uh, uh, preferred common name is the American dog tick, and Exodi scapularis, which is the black-legged or deer tick. Um, this map is the, shows the distribution of tick species at the installations that consistently send us the most ticks. All three species are present in the south, although not, not very large populations of Exodes scapularis biting people, mostly adults in the winter. All spe three species, the orange dots, are also present in, in healthy populations of all three in the mid-Atlantic. And then from the upper Midwest and the Northeast, mostly only Exodes scapularis and Dermacinter variabilis. Um, lone stars are expanding. They travel around on birds, and occasionally we get a very rare lone star tick from the blue dots. Uh, this is another illustration of tick species distributions. The bar graph goes from north up here at Fort McCoy down to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, with blue being the deer ticks and yellow being the lone star ticks. And yet another um, graph to show you tick distribution. Um, throughout Virginia, how it changes as you go north with the deer tick becoming more predominant. All these patterns of geographic distribution are changing um, pretty rapidly, actually, because tick populations are in flux, and you know, they always have you. Um, as I've said, most of the ticks we receive are these three species. We test them using polymerase chain reactions for the pathogens associated with each species, and if a tick is positive, we perform a second PCR targeting a different gene um, for confirmation. Um, and I'd like to take a moment right now to describe the pathogen EML, Ehrlichia species, Wisconsin, found in Exodes scapularis. Um, we test all the deer ticks we receive throughout the country for this novel Ehrlichia. And I'd like to speak a bit about it because it's a pathogen that seems to be, from what we know now, associated with, it, with this region in the upper Midwest of Wisconsin and Minnesota. It was first detected by Mayo Clinic in acutely ill patients from Minnesota and Wisconsin in 2009. Um, for years, our lab had tested all the deer ticks and all the lone star ticks with a multiplex assay for anaplasma and ehrlichia that had been developed at Mayo. The assay also, it, it, when the assay was first published in 2005, they said it's going to amplify Ehrlichia murus also. But the, at that time, Ehrlichia murus had not been associated with cases of human illness. Um, and we'd been seeing this signal for Ehrlichia murus over the years and just making note of it. You know, it wasn't a human pathogen. So when Mayo first reported the Ehrlichia murus-like detection in acutely ill human patients, we were able to take our old records and go back and track this um, amplification in all the samples with assays since about 2005, which was kind of neat. And so we gave them evidence of the possible tick vector, which was Exodes scapularis. Um, and then what followed after the uh, initial index cases at Mayo Clinic was an exemplary, exemplary collaborative effort involving all of these agencies on the right. Um, and, and the organism was actually characterized pretty quickly. Evidence suggested there were field studies collecting mammals to see what the reservoir was. The mouse was implicated from our lab and other tick collections efforts by um, University of Minnesota, Minnesota Department of Health, Wisconsin. Um, lots of people on the ground, and the Army were also doing field collections of ticks. The, turned out that the deer tick was infected. Um, and also in our lab, in the same assay, which is here showing you that we're looking for Ehrlichia uwingi, a lone star pathogen, and Ehrlichia chaffiensis, 
also a Lone Star pathogen with the same assay. We've tested thousands over the years of Lone Star ticks. None of them ever produced um, amplification of, of this EML. Um, and in our deer ticks from New England, from the Mid-Atlantic, nor have we amplified EML from deer ticks from other than Minnesota and Wisconsin, which is really interesting to me. Since then, the organism's being, it's been cultured. It's proving very useful in animal model studies for the lethal human pathogen or Wichia chapiensis. And now more than 40 additional human cases have been reported by Mayo. And so far, they're all from the upper Midwest. Isn't that interesting? Um, and I uh, apologize for not getting the North Carolina State logo onto this, because um, just recently in 2011, Dr. Breitschwartz's group reported um, a very well-characterized study of a dog infected, not with EML, but very closely related the actual early key of yours. And by golly, if the dog wasn't from Minnesota. <laughs> so something's going on here. We're just trying to figure it all out. OK, next slide, please. Um, these are moving away from the upper Midwest. We also receive small numbers of other species biting humans. And I'd like to increase awareness of these two briefly. This is Amblyoma maculatum, the Gulf Coast pick. It was long recognized as a veterinary pathogen before the initial index case of human disease in 2005. Um, it's also pretty well characterized as a vector of Rickettsia parkeri, which is the uh, um, agent of the disease it causes. Um, and the, the tick population appears, up, appears in foci away from the Gulf Coast and along the Gulf Coast. It doesn't bite people as often as the Lone Star tick, but they're 35, 40% of them are infected with Rickettsia parkeri. So there's something to watch for. Um, of course, we find the tick along the Gulf Coast, since it's a Gulf Coast tick, but also foci in Tennessee, Kentucky, Kansas, a big focus in Fairfax County, Virginia. Um, it also harbors other Rickettsia, Rickettsia ambiani, and sometimes Rickettsia felis. But we don't know whether this tick actually transmits, tran can transmit these rickettsial pathogens. pathogens. And the, the, the ability of rickettsia and DNA to cause human disease is not established yet. Um, rickettsia parkeri infection produces febrile symptoms, eschars, and papular rashes, just you know, more confusing rash symptoms after tick bite. And then we also occasionally get brown dog ticks, Rhipicephalus sanguineus. Um, it's very widely distributed around the world, most, but more likely to be found in warmer climates than the upper Midwest. It has a strong association with dogs and dog kennels. And it's a notorious veterinary pest and vector of canine diseases. Um, what's unusual about this tick, it can tolerate a drier habitat than most US ticks, and it can reproduce in homes. And it's been newly recognized as a good vector of rocky, fatal lethal Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever in the US. And it's infected with other rickettsia um, with sort of unknown pathogenicity. Okay, next slide. And Exodes aphinus is a fascinating tick under study right now, especially in Virginia and North Carolina. Um, there's, they're collecting the species to answer questions about its role in the transmission of Borrelia burgdorferi to humans. Uh, it's a South, Central and South American tick previously described um, from Florida, Georgia, southern states, but it's invading coastal North Carolina and Virginia. And um, where it was first misidentified as Exodes scapularis, can you guess why? Um, it's infected with Borrelia burgdorferi at a much higher rate than Exodes scapularis from North Carolina and Virginia. But it appears that this tick doesn't bite people. So you know, it's being studied now. I know Dr. Breitschwartz's lab has, has studied this tick, too. Um, what's its role in the Lyme, Lyme disease transmission cycle? However, let's go back to the upper Midwest, where we received mostly Sony scapularis, not aphinus, and dermocenter variabilis. Um, Adult exodes 
Scapularis are very abundant here in vector human disease. We test them all for Borrelia burgdorferi, Anaplasma phagocytophil, Babesia microti, and EML. The male tick can certainly be infected, but it doesn't really feed, therefore it's not involved in disease transmission. And the larvae or the hatchlings of the species are not infected. Um, not, the tick is not born with Borrelia burgdorferi, Anaplasma phagocytophil, and Babesia microti. EML, but it can carry a novel Borrelia recently associated with cases of human disease, which is Borrelia miyamotoi. And um, we have detected one in an adult at uh, Camp Ripley. Dermacenter variabilis, the American dog tick, is also very, very, very abundant here. That's probably what the lady collected at the hotel. It can vector to Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but the disease is very rare here. Here's the map of case incidents, and you can look up to Wisconsin and Minnesota, and it's just, the focus is in the south and central US. One other thing, it's only the adult wood ticks or American dog ticks that bite people. Um, not only in the upper Midwest, but throughout its range, the immatures just don't bite people in all the hundreds and thousands we've received over the years. We've only gotten one nymph of Dermacenter variabilis, and that was from a lady in New Jersey. Okay, back to Minnesota. Here the pathogen prevalence is from the ticks removed from our soldiers and submitted to our program. Um, very robust rates if you look at the infection rates over here of all these different pathogens. Remember I said earlier that consistently the highest infection rates from any region in the U.S., um, you know, is Camp Ripley, Minnesota. I can't, I don't know your state, I can't make generalizations from our Camp Ripley data about the rest of the state, um, but what I'm going to present is a comparison of Camp Ripley and Fort McCoy with infection rates and ticks from Fort Indian Town Gap in eastern Pennsylvania. Um, to illustrate the importance of ticks from this region. Okay, on the previous slide, uh, it was the total infection prevalences. This slide has basically the co-infections um, singled out. These are not the single infections. So quite a few co and triple infections here at Camp Ripley. Um, there, there are 27 co-infected adults but only 18 co-infected nymphs. Uh, this difference is to, is to be expected and can be explained because the adults have had two blood meals or opportunities to feed on an infected animal and the nymphs just one. I like this better than the cycle because here is the nymph. It has had the larval meal. Maybe these rodents and birds were infected with Borrelia burgdorferi. So the nymph has had one meal. But the adult over here has had the larval meal and it's had the nymphal meal. So uh, it's had two opportunities to pick up infections from its animal host. Okay, on to Wisconsin, Fort McCoy. A new, report, a new report finds cases of Lyme disease in Wisconsin, finds that cases of Lyme disease in Wisconsin have nearly doubled in the past couple of years. Um, a University of Wisconsin entomologist named Phil Pelletieri says, we're finding ticks are becoming more prevalent in places we've not seen them before, especially in the eastern part of the state. And previously today there were um, Case, Lyme disease case maps, a case map of Wisconsin, and indeed the, the eastern part of the state was um, not nearly as prevalent. The, the counties were pretty much clear of Lyme disease cases, and it seemed to be all in the western part. So ticks are expanding their range here, um, and the rates at Fort McCoy, oh, also, these rates I'm presenting with both at Camp Ripley and Fort McCoy. They span their total of 15 years, and they're quite robust. Um, but I don't, I'm not presenting the year-by-year -year data, but I just wanted to tell you that each year the infection rates are commensurate, commensurately robust. And the co-infections, 
fewer co-infections here um, at Fort McCoy, but still um, a triple infection. And again, the adults are more apt to be co-infected than the nymphs. Okay, and here's comparison with Pennsylvania, which is a state with a very high Lyme disease case incidence for sure. But note the smaller prevalence of the other pathogens and the smaller prevalence uh, percent prevalence of Anaplasma phagus autophilum, and we've only gotten one positive for Babesia microti. Um, and also, we only had one co-infected tick here. I didn't even display it on the slide. It was the one that was positive for Babesia microti was also co-infected with Lyme disease. So it's a different pattern, even though a very robust prevalence of infection with Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, these three army posts are, have very many similarities. They're all very large with ample tick habitats and wildlife galore, ample hosts. They're all three reserve training facilities, which is great for us to study because the soldiers will come in for two weeks and not leave. So we can be sure with our, or pretty sure with our passively collected tick data that the soldiers have actually gotten the ticks on the post because they're, they're there and not leaving. Um, and the soldiers are even, the, the tick bite victims are even wearing the same clothes because they're in army uniforms. So it's nice to compare these. So, so why are there differences in rates of infections with certain pathogens, pathogens uh, between the th three posts? Um, so ecoepidemiology is fundamentally a search for pattern. And sometimes one begins to suggest itself or tug at you. And this one, we'd always gotten plenty of Ixodi scapularis from all of these three posts, Camp Ripley, Fort McCoy, and Fort Indian Town Gap. It always had high infection rates. But from Camp Ripley, there would be adults later in the summer than from the other installations. So we decided to make some comparisons to see if a pattern would emerge. And our observations, when we counted them, counted them up, were correct. Uh, greater prevalence of adults overall from Camp Ripley than these other two posts. In the next slide, I just pull out the same adult prevalence um, to emphasize there are a lot more. We were, we were receiving over 15 years a lot more adults from Camp Ripley. Okay, we investigated this uh, um, further. Um, on the form that's filled out when people submit a tick, uh, we ask the question, when was the tick removed? We found that this gives us the best estimate of when the tick was active. If you say, when did you acquire the tick? That's sort of crazy, because if you knew when you were acquiring the tick, you did get it off. You know, and people have, people don't know their tick biology. They say, well, I've had it on for five weeks. Probably not, I don't think so. So we asked, when was tick removed? Because people remember when they pulled the tick off. So using the data we had with that removal date, we created these charts. And so in the two on the right, McCoy and Indian Town Gap, you see the typical pattern of summer nymphal abundance and the decrease of adults in the summer. Um, that's the typical New England mid-Atlantic pattern. But here at Ripley, look at that. In June, there were more adults than nymphs. I sort of had a hunch about this, but until we graphed it out, um, this was uh, a, it was so dramatic it was a surprise. And this is, I'm sorry to torture you all with this slide, um, just unfocus your eyes. It's every June from 1997 to 2012. And notice, and the adults are the blue bars, so just notice at the top of Camp Ripley there's a big difference, you see more blue bars. That's the adults. And then we calculated the proportions, and again, a real dramatic difference of the June data. This is June. So those adults are out there when the nymphs are out there. And so we're trying to figure out why, and the best evidence we have so far, the best clue to why the adults and nymphs overlap at Camp Ripley lies in this recent study by Gatewood and Al. These researchers tracked not the adults, but the larval and the nymphal population of Ixodi scapularis in all these various locations. And they found that colder winters and shorter summers, summer seasons caused overlap of all the life stages. Note, and, and Pat was talking about latitude with the study from Vermont. 
I guess this study, the study has very rigorous um, temperature parameters measured. And there really is a difference. Minnesota's different from Wisconsin. I think it's kind of crazy. When I think hot, I think red. But if, in this study, the, the red is the cold. Um, so the colder place is Minnesota. That means shorter summer season. Wisconsin is pretty cold. Um, and then look over in Pennsylvania. Big difference in eastern Pennsylvania. The big circles indicate the overlap of the larval ticks and the nymphal ticks. And our data shows there's also overlap of the adult ticks in Minnesota more and Wisconsin. So but a very crude analogy would be the seasons are short up here. It's the, the, the cycles between vector and host are happening all at the same time. It's very compressed. And that's the best clue I've found so far to explain why there's you know, more infection here in Minnesota. OK, so the Army does all this testing and surveillance, but what does it do to prevent tick-borne disease in the troops? Um, in our program at the Public Health Command, we do tick safety training and teach um, to prevent tick-borne disease. You need to avoid tick bite. How can you protect yourself? You can recognize tick habitat. You can learn when the ticks are active. You can learn tick seasonality and biology. And also, you can use repellents. Um, the goal of our program is preventing tick-borne disease. And one of the best ways to do it, as I just said, is to avoid tick bite. But if you fail that, remove the tick promptly. Um, it's, and to do this, it really helps to know your enemy. Uh, you need to recognize tick habitat. Ticks you're, you're most likely to encounter in the US are very vulnerable to desiccation. Remember desiccation. Ticks are not going to be out on a um, hot, windy day when they can desiccate. Um, you can easily recognize the habitat that might harbor ticks. You won't find them in a well-known lawn or a bright, sunny location. They need layered shade and moist air. But like I said before, all the tick wants in the whole world is to get a blood meal. They've hatched from the egg or molted, and they are starved. They don't nibble on soil organisms. They don't drink free water. They must have a blood meal, no other way. They're starved, and they're much better at finding you than you are at finding them. Um, they climb up on the vegetation. They hold out their forelegs, which have Velcro-like structures on the foot pads. And their legs are armed with all sorts of chemoreceptors, analogous to insect antennae. They can sense your CO2, your movement, your body heat, the vibrations of your footfalls. Sounds, the brown dog tick, Repsephalus sanguineus, it's been found to be attracted to the sound of barking dogs. <laughs> so they, you know, they're better at finding you than you are at finding them. Some species also have eyes. And they all have some kind of light receptors. Um, they're fast when they grab onto you. They run for a covered spot under your clothes to attach. And with those barbed mouth parts, interestingly, you don't feel them attach. The moment the tick begins to saw into your skin, it secretes saliva to anesthetize your skin, cement itself onto you, to dis and also disarm your immune system and lyse your capillaries. Um, the rush of warm blood into the tick then triggers the tick to grow new tissue to engorge. They don't just swell up, they grow new tissue to engorge, the nymphs and the females. And it causes any pathogens dormant within the unfed tick to multiply hugely and change chemically. So the ability of the tick to infect with those pathogens is triggered. Um, oh, and um, Dr. Chaconis, I want movies instead of these nice slides. As the ticks feed, they release anticoagulants, anti-inflammatories, and immunosuppressive molecules that mediate the formation of the feeding lesion. They're pool feeders create a pooling, to create a pool of blood under the skin. And the tick saliva, uh, suppress, it also suppresses the hosts, the animals, your immune system. And, and it does that for its own good in order to stay attached and feed. Um, this, the Lyme disease bacteria, it's been found, can use this immunomodulatory effect of the tick saliva to 
piggyback undetected um, into the host animal's bloodstream. Inhibition of the host innate immune responses by tick saliva is beneficial for both tick attachment and the uptake of Borrelia burgdorferi establishment of the spirochete. Um, all these ticks are pool feeders. I was talking about the pool of blood formed by the lysing of the capillaries that's done by the tick saliva. Um, while this pool is forming over a period of a couple days, the tick is synthesizing new cuticle. And after the pool is formed, um, in some cases this takes several days, the tick doesn't, it doesn't engorge stepwise, little by little. It takes the big sip at the end of this process, which is why you can go to bed having showered and not detected a tick, wake up in the morning with an engorged tick and say, how could I have missed that? It's because they really take the big sip, they increase quickly. And the first sip of this blood starts a uh, pathogen population explosion and violence reactivation. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever transmission is thought to occur in less than 10 hours. But in most cases, uh, for example, Lyme disease transmission by the deer tick, you have a margin of time, 24 to 72 hours before the tick can infect you. Those spirochetes take longer to grow. So this is a margin of safety. It gives you um, time to find and remove the tick and hopefully prevent tick-borne disease. So quickly before my time is up, I wanted to show you a couple of new developments from DOD. Um, in addition to the tick testing and surveillance I've just described, we've got um, some good new programs. The Walter Reed Biosystematics Unit is developing TickMap which is an online interactive tool for mapping worldwide tick abundance distribution and pathogen prevalence. We've already entered most all our tick records up until 2010 into tick map. And there's a big effort to get everyone collecting in the US to participate in this program. Also, this is brand new. The Naval Infectious Diseases Diagnostic <laughs> Laboratory, or the NIDLE, um, it's kind of an offshoot of the Rickettsial uh, lab at the uh, Naval Medical Research Center in Bethesda. They're, they've just began to offer um, diagnosis of human rickettsial diseases using their very specific PCRs for different rickettsia. Mm -hmm. The service is free to DOD um, personnel, and they, they're planning to expand it first to the ehrlichial diseases, and also they do dinky fever. But the plan is to include a form for submitting human samples to the, to the middle um, in our tick test kit. Um, just to, that would be such a convenient service. And um, we'd have some good data from that because the same assays for rickettsia that we use on the tick are the ones that would be used to make human diagnosis. So the program could insist in proving um, the accuracy of incidence of germination, especially for these puzzling rickettsial diseases. But besides surveillance and testing, the DOD has made a big effort to attack the root of the problem of tick-borne disease, um, which is repellents. The use of the DOD repellent system, which is uh, treated uniform, deed on your skin, and then um, properly worn uniform. Army boots, the tongue of the boot is continuous. It's not separate. And you tuck, you, you tuck your blouse pants into that boot. And boy, that's good tick, tick protection right there. Because they, you know, most shoes we wear, the tongue is separate. But these, this, and if they're treated with repellent, if you've got repellent on your skin, that's really effective. But compliance has never been complete, especially in case of, of the system's most effective component against ticks, which is the permethrin treated uniform. It's a lot easier to give your guys a tube of D and say, OK, I'm, you must rub this on your face and hands, than to think two weeks ahead in advance and spray those uniforms and get the spray on hand. In the past, you had to treat your uniform with spray from a can or use this um, sort of immersion technique that we call shake and bake, but all the stuff you have to order in advance and plan. Or this too, you have to get someone who's a registrar, registered pesticide applicator in your unit 
to um, spray the uniforms and let them dry. All this, the Promethean is very effective, but you have to plan in advance. So just last year, with the, the cooperation of a galaxy of agencies, a constellation of acronyms, as you see here, um, Army uniforms are now factory treated with Promethean. Their use is now universal. That is all that's in the system. Um, DOD started working with the USDA in World War II to develop repellents. And about 1980, this permethrin was identified as an effective clothing repellent. And then the, most of the recent research to make this good on the uniforms, there's been a lot of re research on safety and efficacy, but also um, you know, fabric impregnation has been studied. So, and of course the products are EPA registered, and here's the <coughs> label in the uniform. And the Army Surgeon General considers permethrin treated uniforms one of the most important protective measures for soldiers. He fully endorses permethrin factory treatment. That's our poster to try to convince the soldiers that this is a good thing to use. So thank you all very much. And I certainly want to thank Pat Smith for the organizational efforts that she's put into getting all of us as speakers here and the organizing committee to allow me to come and talk about a genus of bacteria that uh, increasingly has compromised and confused my life. In the context of disclosures, um, I am the chief scientific officer for a newly formed company, Galaxy Diagnostics, in the Research Triangle Park that has an animal health division, a human health division, and a rather meager, but we hope growing research division to try to better understand these diseases. Um, most of the funding for the research that I have done has come out of the animal health industry with specific support from several companies, including Bayer Animal Health and IDEX Laboratories. So Bartonella species um, are actually in this big group that includes the Rickettsias, the Ehrlichias, uh, and many of these other what are referred to as alpha proteobacteria. I think the reason that microbiologists, clinicians, and others miss these organisms for literally decades is the fact that unlike Staph E. coli that divide every 10 to 15 minutes, these bacteria require somewhere between 22 to 24 hours to make another baby. So if you're trying to detect them diagnostically, this makes it very challenging. As you can see from this electron micrograph, the early work done in the mid-90s in most of the Bartonella research labs emphasized the fact that all of these newly discovered Bartonellas were intraerythrocytic bacteria. And the only one, to my knowledge, that can be seen on a right scheme-sustained blood smear from a patient is Bartonella bacilliformis from South America. But research after that time really broadened the number of cells that these bacteria could invade. And so far, I'm not aware of an in vitro study yet in which a cell could not be invaded by this particular bacteria, which again, in the context of the previous lectures that were given, an organism like Borrelia burgdorferi that can get throughout the bloodstream into many tissues in the body can cause very complex symptoms, and Bartonella can do the same. Uh, and it is the only bacteria known to date, there's certainly viruses, that can infect CD34 progenitor cells within the bone marrow, which I do believe may be of clinical relevance. Now, for the last several years, my thought has been that Bartonellosis may be a modern day epidemic. And I would suggest to you that when a third of the European population died of bubonic plague in the 1400s, they didn't know that it was a bacterial infection. They didn't know that there was a reservoir host, such as the rat, and they didn't know that there was a vector, such as the rat flea, that was responsible for this. They actually thought it was divine intervention and that they had upstate God, and that was the reason for this. I put the quote by Aristotle, which I actually had on my desk at home in a curled up piece of yellow paper for a very long period of time. I don't know how long, because it's, it's the only consolation prize that I have in the context of my thinking about Bartonella, is that it may be the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting that thought. 
So that's kind of where I've been on this. And when I initially made this slide, how do you hide an epi epidemic, I said, it's hard, but I changed it. Maybe it's easy. You start with a genus of bacteria that was not known to exist in North America before 1990, highlighted by Stanley Falco, who's the past president of the American Society of Microbiology. You have a bacteria like Borrelia burgdorferi that behaves like a stealth pathogen, that can fly under the radar, that can remain hidden in tissues for months to years, and in ways that we clearly do not understand, can then contribute to disease processes. You maintain a large, and for me as a veterinarian, every news relative to Bartonella has been bad news because I'm responsible for that pet and wildlife population, and I don't like zoonotic diseases where it's the animal that's at fault for a human becoming infected. And then regrettably, and as we look more and more, you facilitate transmission, not only through vectors, but by other mechanisms like scratches, bites, needle sticks, and perhaps some other mechanisms that need to be better qualified. So if it was not for HIV, I would not be giving this lecture today. Bartonella's would not have been discovered, in my opinion, if it were not for the fact that pathologists in the late 80s and the early 90s saw two very prototypical lesions, vascular angiomatosis, as you can see here, and peliosis hepatis. David Relman, a young infectious disease physician at Stanford, was among the first to use PCR amplification using what are called eubacterial primers to get a chunk of DNA from the bacteria that were in these lesions and said, oh gee, this looks like the old trench fever agent, which is Bartonella quintana, and also looks like a new bacteria that no one's ever seen before, which is Bartonella hensilae. Within a very short period of time, Russ Rigner, a rickettsiologist at CDC, was involved in testing an isolate from an AIDS patient in Houston, Texas, that becomes the type strain of Bartonella hensilae and the Houston 1 isolate, and he then made the association between that organism and cat scratch disease. In the context of Bartonella and vasoproliferative diseases, we then went on to show that dogs that were immunosuppressed by veterinarians therapeutically for disease processes would develop bacillary angiomatosis, as do individuals who are immunosuppressed because they have a retrovirus. And then, without going through everything on this slide, I was then contacted by a physician in Chicago whose son had a very, very unusual tumor, and it's taken me several years to be able to say epithelioid mangioendothelioma <laughs> without hesitation. Um, and amazingly enough, that son had the same Bartonella, Bartonella vinsonii burkhoffii, that we first discovered and described in conjunction with the special pathogens group at CDC from a dog with endocarditis, which we'll get to here in a minute. In the context of Bartonella and vasoproliferative lesions, and again, emphasizing that these bacteria that live within erythrocytes, probably their niche is the endothelium within the lining of our blood vessels, we have then documented, in collaboration with their physicians, epithelioid and mangioendothelioma patients on three continents now, including um, England or the United Kingdom and Australia, with these particular organisms. So one of the major issues in regard to Bartonella is causation. And the nice part about this particular bacterium causation is if you have endocarditis and a big lesion on your heart valve, and someone can grow that bacteria from the blood or PCR amplify and sequence it from the heart valve that's removed as surgery, there's no debate there in regard to causation, which I'll come back to in a minute because I've certainly gotten beaten up fairly substantially by my peer group relative to this genus that I seem to be excited about and causation. Again, before 1993, because there were not techniques to detect these organisms, they had never been associated with endocarditis in any human anywhere in the world literature. And I would also call, call your attention to this one down here, Bartonella mayo tenensis, which was reported by the Mayo Clinic in a patient from Minnesota who you would now have a problem because we do not know the vector, we do not know the reservoir, but predictably there is a reservoir for this organism in this part of the country because every other Bartonella has a re preferred reservoir host and then can be found in others. And as was set up by very well by Dr. Stitch, and I'll emphasize a little more later, 
as we started looking at the human literature, that very first dog that we cultured with endocarditis that becomes Bartonella vinsonii burkhoffii, which we now have grown out of, unfortunately, too many veterinarians who are sick, um, was in a case of endocarditis that was being immunosuppressed because of a tentative diagnosis of systemic lupus erythematosus. So I've alluded to this causation issue, and so you find a new bacteria, which many researchers have. There's, as many of you know, seems to be a new virus that comes along. There seems to be another bacteria. And, and trying to figure out what these organisms are doing is very difficult. One of the things I say to the physicians in the audience and the researchers in particular is I think we've tried to blame complex disease expression on a single organism, which we need to, with the Human Microbiome Project, stop doing. So anytime we're dealing with a really complex disease expression, what I tell our residents is look for more than one bug. So what you can see here that is described in this pa paper is what we propose is if you can find or isolate the same pathogen, bacteria, virus, fungus, protozoa, from the same pathology, and that would assume that you could actually get three pathologists to agree that it was the same pathology, um, and three different mammalian species, then that might satisfy this particular posture that we occur, that we have proposed. The importance is that's already been done in the context of Bartonella for these four categories of disease. Okay? And so, if, again, just Causation is always an issue, and um, if I guess I should go back and, uh, oops, excuse me, that Virgil's credited with stating happy is he who knows the cause of things, and we're still working on that premise. So one of the problems with Bartonella's is that there are an increasing number of arthropod vectors that are transmitting these organisms. Clearly, the ones I have listed on this slide are important. As a guy that started with rickettsia research, or lichia research, babesia research, and then got into Bartonella research, I am now more concerned about the worldwide impact of fleas causing disease in humans and animals than I am ticks. And I would ask of the physicians in the audience, would all the physicians raise your hands? Thank you. Now keep them up for a minute. Everybody that asks their patient whether they've been exposed to fleas or cats with fleas, keep your hands up. Everybody who doesn't, put them down. Thank you. So if, if I'm right, we need to add another question to our physical exam and hit, um, to our historical evaluations of patients. So Christoph Diejo is probably the premier basic science Bartonella researcher in the world. He's in Switzerland very, very nice guy, and I'm using his cartoon here, because what he's depicted is ticks, which we'll get to in just a second, fleas, and then sand flies, and essentially the common pathogenesis where these organisms, as um, Bill suggested, occurs with some other organisms, are actually amplified within the vector, then defecated out, and it's due usually to scratching these in, or the cat contaminates itself with flea feces, and then manages to bite or scratch a human. We believe they go into dendritic cells, and from the dendritic cells end up in the bone marrow and into the, the vasculature. And what we, and I'll come back to this later because it becomes important in regard to diagnosis in dogs, horses, and humans, is they cause a relapsing pattern of bacteremia. And again, putting Dr. Stitch before me, where he believes this occurs with a lot of the vector-borne organisms, uh, I think is true of this one as well. So further emphasizing this idea of asking patients about cat ownership, we now know that cats can be infected with five Bartonella species. We know for sure that three of those five are flea transmitted to cats, and recently with an internist infectious disease collaborator in veterinary medicine at Colorado State University, we've proven that those fleas off of a cat that's infected with Bartonella henselae can infect the dog in your house as well. The other very interesting part of this is Bartonella quintana, which historically was trench fever, and they did the entire genome sequence of this. In the very first line, they state that this only infects people, is only transmitted by the human body louse, both of which are not true. 
So this is an example, again, of one of those <coughs> very poorly known and understood Bartonella's that happens to be in cats. And this was published in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology a couple years ago. This was an 18-year-old woman that after we published on finding Bartonella's in mostly veterinarians and veterinary technicians, her parents contacted me because over a four-year period, she had a progressive, very slowly progressive illness with an increase in peripheral visual loss, a sensory neuropathy, hallucinations, and then in the last six months to a year, all those other symptoms had developed. She was being cared for by a neurologist, a psychiatrist, and a neuro-ophthalmologist, and we, which we had not gotten very much even out of the veterinarians, managed to determine that she was infected with Bartonella cholerae. Now, we didn't initially determine that because this is a PCR targeting the 16S, 23S intergenic spacer region between those two ribosomal genomes. And Bartonella has a very large intergenic spacer region and it has a highly variable intergenic spacer region. So we get Ricardo Maggi, who's the guy that really does the work in the lab on human samples, got an Amplicon. He tried to direct sequence it, he couldn't. He tried to clone it and sequence it. He was unsuccessful. So we felt like maybe this person had a Bartonella, but if she did, we couldn't prove it. We were not doing serology to Bartonella cholerae specifically at that time, so the asterisk means we did this later. And what happened is once we got this assay up and we tested her and she came up positive and we knew this result, I contacted her parents 294 days later. She came back in to us and blood was collected at the local hospital. And now you can see with enrichment culture and BAP-GM that we'll talk about, we could actually get enough organism to get a sequence. Her titer was higher than what it was earlier, which probably is totally meaningless. 570 d days later, she is at Duke because she's now failed two courses of doxycycline and rifampin and her titer remains the same. We can again find this organism by enrichment culture 801 days later after another course of doxycycline and revamp and that she actually took her antibiotics this time, um, she cleared, seemingly cleared the infection. And I say seemingly because I believe what Bill has told everyone is absolutely true. It's very regrettable for me as a veterinary internist that I've treated dogs for years that I thought I cured their infection, probably only to put them into a state of remission. So tick transmission, um, not by intention, but we asked one of our PhD graduate students, Sarah Billiter, um, who now works for the Cal state of California in the public health office there, to do a review of everything that was known in the world literature on Bartonella transmission with an emphasis on tick transmission because we and others were generating some evidence that was either case-based, individual dogs, individual humans, epidemiologic data where dogs with antibodies to Bartonella had antibodies to other well-known tick-borne organisms. And then it was just starting at this time that labs mostly in Europe were PCRing Bartonella hensilae out of ticks. And so we've, we said, yeah, maybe ticks are doing this, which created controversy. Um, then CDC and some French veterinarians did a study where they used Oxodes rosensis and a cat model and suggested that Bartonella hensilae might be transmitted. Uh, this was rejected by most of the classical entomologists. And then more recently, again, the same groups collaborating with CDC and Michael Levin were able to prove that Oxodes rosensis can transmit a Bartonella, uh, a rodent Bartonella, in an experimental setting, control setting. So we still don't know for sure that ticks are ever transmitting a Bartonella to a human, but at least the evidence is evolving that they may be. And hopefully I'll remember to say what I really need to say when I get to a later slide on that. Now, this is published in Parasites and Vectors about a month ago. It was a physician in Holland whose son and her were exposed to ticks. She believed that her illness occurred after that tick exposure. She actually flew her son herself and then her husband and daughter over there. We tested everyone in the family, the two sick people we isolated Bartonella hensilae from and the two that were not, we did not. The reason I included this is that as many of the physicians in here know, this stria lesion has been associated 
in the literature with Bartonella infections. But to my knowledge, I could never find a reference that said anyone ever proved that or looked at it histologically or PCR from it or found any evidence of the organism there. And in working with Dr. Marna Erickson, who made the comment earlier, who has developed some extremely wonderful techniques to start looking at skin for bacteria. And in this instance, she's using a patient with bacillary angiomatosis and an antibody directed at Bartonella henselae. Um, this is the lesion from the stria, and I realize with all the stuff I have on the slide, it's a little hard to see, but there's some nice rib bacteria in here. And there's also other bacteria. For the physicians in the audience, we also know that BAPGM grows other alpha proteobacteria that I was never taught about, and we have no idea if they're vector transmitted. But again, this idea of trying to blame complex pathology on a single organism probably is not the smartest conclusion we ever came to. In regard to Bartonella and reservoir host, and again, this is the second part of what is really bad news for us as veterinarians because, and I'll use the example of squirrels. Gray squirrels have their own Bartonella species. Flying squirrels have a separate Bartonella species. Groundhogs have a separate Bartonella species. Brown squirrels in California have a separate Bartonella species. How many physicians ask, have you had contact with a squirrel? <laughs> Probably not. So you can see the problem that I think may result in an exquisitely large group of reservoirs out there with these organisms in the blood with a system where vectors have been transmitting amongst these reservoirs for thousands, if not tens of thousands of years that we didn't know about, and a bacteria that has such a slow dividing time that microbiologists would have never grown it with the techniques that we had historically. Now, the other thing that Bill did that was very helpful to me is I believe that the dog is the best naturally occurring animal model for human disease. I don't know whether it's because they co-evolved with us for the last 10,000 years or whatever, but as you can see on this particular slide, I have looked at the human summaries of cat scratch disease literature, atypical manifestations, and then as a veterinary internist, I went and looked for those things specifically in dogs. And I looked for Bartonella in those dog patients, and I not only found the Bartonella that's responsible for cat scratch disease, but we have found, as you saw on that previous slide, several other Bartonellas. So after we isolated the dog Bartonella, Bartonella vinsonii agrocolfi, from a dog that was being immunosuppressed that had endocarditis, another graduate student, Brandy Papillardo, came into the lab and I said, okay, I know we found this in one dog. How many have I missed in my career? So she spent five years trying to explain that to me. And after five years, had one more isolate, which wasn't, it was a Vinsoniac Burkhoffi, but it became genotype two. So there's genotype one, two, three, and four. And that's important because our US military is shipping dogs from Europe that are infected with genotype three to come over here to get trained in Texas to develop endocarditis once they're over here, which I suggested to them may not be the smartest strategy since those dogs as a taxpayer cost us an awful lot of money. But the Rationale for this slide was we asked the question, can we come up with a better way to help isolate these organisms? And because Bartonella was not just in a tick or just in a flea, we asked the question, are they happier in the insects than they are in mammalian growth media? And so this was how the two of us, and Dr. Santaki now works for Health Canada in Ottawa as a medical microbiologist after she left my lab as a postdoc. Um, and this is how we spent our Christmas that particular year. So that, the qu answer to that question was yes. North Carolina State University was smart enough to look at that invention and say, gee, we should patent this. And um, I couldn't even spell patent at that point in time, much less what it meant. And then after they did that and tried to find someone on both the veterinary medical side and human medical side to take this technology and do something with it, and I met with some pretty big people in big companies and said, just give me enough money for a technician for a couple years and we'll prove to you this might have some utility. That didn't work so well. <laughs> and uh, by a, a long and circuitous route, we ended up forming this company, which was not what I intended to do at this stage of my career. 
So we've also transferred BAPGM to CDC, and I have the reference here for Michael Kasoy. Michael knew, based on serology, that there was a unique Bartonella species in patients in Thailand with acute febrile illness. They had tried multiple ways to isolate that, and within six months of sticking it in BAPGM, they had an isolate that they characterized, and that's in this particular reference. So after that, so, so now we've got a new way of trying to do this. Is it going to actually work in dogs? And Ashley Duncan, another PhD student in the lab, came up, along with Ricardo Maggi, with this particular approach, which probably is as complicated an approach as you can have to find an infectious agent. So from every sample, and with human samples, we PCR amplify from blood and from serum. From enrichment culture, we PC PCR on a research basis at 7 and 14 days. And we subculture to see if we can actually get these things to grow, which we currently have a postdoc working on who has a PhD in medical microbiology, and it's still problematic to get them to grow on a plate, which I'll get to later. So finally, if we get an amplicon, we sequence that. So that's how we went from an insect growth media. We validated this in dogs, um, which is what this study described, and we started getting pretty excited because it was working. I would then identify dogs with granulomatous hepatitis, dogs with granulomatous splenitis, dogs that came in with unusual presentations and lymphadenopathy, and I tell my veterinary colleagues about that in case reports at national meetings. What happened then is I'd have veterinarians come up to me and say, can you test me? And obviously, I could not. But after getting collaboration with Duke ID, and our institutional review board, we put together a study and we started testing veterinarians. The first 50 veterinarians we tested, 25 had one or more Bartonella species in their blood, so 50%, which really got my attention. And this is just one example of a veterinarian from our institution that's published in Parasites and Vectors, progressive weight loss to the point that this person was on the faculty, is this HIV, is it cancer? Development of progressive muscle weakness, seeing a neurologist at the University of North Carolina Medical Center. Finally, it become very incoordinated. MRI, poorly defined vascular lesion. When he came to talk to me, he said, Ed, it seems like my life's falling apart and so is my daughter's because we just had to pull her out of school. Straight A student, she's seeing a neurologist in Raleigh and her problem is headache, muscle pain, and insomnia. And if there is a combination which is totally nonspecific, that fits Bartonella, it's headache, insomnia, and muscle pain. So, and we'll come to that a little bit later on. Mother and two sons were healthy, mother and two sons were blood culture negative. Now I can tell you that it was very fortuitous, and we were lucky that this veterinarian was positive on the initial PCR and we were able to sequence it. So anything I put up here has, is confirmed by a DNA sequence. It's not a real-time PCR. We've done real-time PCR. This is all conventional PCR followed by sequences. He went back to UNC once we got this result. They were kind enough to get blood serum, and I'm not showing you the antibody titers here in CSF. He was infected with Bartonella vinsonii hypercolifi. He also had periodonta periodontal disease that occurred simultaneous with the onset of his neurologic disease. So being a veterinarian, and this was not covered under my IRB, but we got sterile swabs, we swabbed, and Ricardo again was able to PCR Bartonella out of this, which led us to then test dogs, and we were able to PCR Bartonella out of dog saliva. There is a manuscript from China that is now published that if you're in China and you have antibodies to Bartonella, you've been bitten by a dog, statistically. <laughs> so dog bites, how many physicians see patients with dog bites? So you can see for me as a veterinarian, dog bites are a whole much, lot more concerned than they were a couple years ago. This patient, like his daughter, was co-infected with Bartonella hensilae, and we didn't detect the Bartonella hensilae until after he had been treated um, for initially for Bartonella vinsonii hypercolifi. Now, this is why I'm really proud of what we've done in regard to this BAP-GM, because I believe that our PCR, we've targeted more, more, multiple genes, we've looked at multiple tachylorimerases, we've spent 20 years trying to be able to detect this organism on a molecular basis, so I think our PCR is as good as anybody else's PCR, and therefore, no lab in the world, if we didn't detect it, do I believe would confirm that this girl was infected. 
after enrichment culture, which was the only way we could ever confirm her infection, and then with this. And there may be clearly an analogy there with a the recently published paper relative to Borrelia burgdorferi. So just a couple more slides, and then I'll finish, and we can go have some lunch. We've done two major studies, and again, I've got a number of frustrations relative to this genus of bacteria, but one, if you think it's hard to get funding for Lyme disease research, try to get funding for a genus of bacteria that no one believes is important, which is Bartonella. And what you, what you can see here is what we first studied was veterinarians, veterinary technicians, veterinary spouses. What we then studied as a result of a phone call on a Friday afternoon from a rheumatologist in Maryland whose name is Robert Moziani was 296 of his patients. And these were handpicked by him over about a year and a half period. Sent to us, blinded. As a matter of fact, I was so blind, I agreed to test a few of his patients and I didn't know a year and a half later that my lab had tested 296 of his patients until we started going out and separating the data as to who the patients were. So, uh-oh. But at any rate, what is most important, I think, from this data is when we get down here. One, females always seem to be overrepresented in both populations. But this is the important part. In Mosianis, he had more patients that he had picked from his patient group that had either an increase in C-reactive protein, a repeatable increase in sed rate, or what he refers to as small vessel disease. Now, as a veterinary internist, I don't think much about small vessel disease because we don't see a lot of strokes in dogs and other things. So hopefully that means more to the physicians in the audience than it means to me. But what is also remarkable, and I wouldn't have believed this, but this was all done blindly, it was all done in a biosafety level three lab where the only person that was working at that time was Ricardo Maggi, is that 41% of these individuals we could amplify and sequence of Bartonella from their blood. So I can't comment on treatment of humans. Uh, it's the one species my license does not allow me to comment on treatment in the context of mammals. But what I can tell you is that Dogs, again, are a good model for humans. And what we've learned from dogs is that 50% of dogs, approximately, and 50% of humans that we test do not have antibodies to this organism if they're bacteremic. 50%. And that means seronegative infection is almost the expectation rather than the exception. The other is relapsing bacteremia. We, how this happened is I had tested veterinarians with neurologic disease. Everything was negative. It took us several months to get the results back to them. They would say, I'm a whole lot worse than I was before. I'd say, get three samples pulled by your physician and send us three samples within a week, and we'll test three. And it became pretty obvious that if we tested three rather than one, our sensitivity went up. So that was recently published by um, Beth Bertulak, who is a PhD student in the lab right now with a degree in infectious disease epidemiology. Antibiotic sensitivity, we can't tell you whether these organisms are resistant or not because in most instances we cannot make isolates. So that's a real problem. Treatment failures are clearly occurring. We have seen people treated for six months. I tell veterinarians you cannot float a cat or a dog in enough doxycycline to eliminate this infection. And I believe that to be true of humans. Bartonella is the only bacteria I know that floats around our bloodstream, lives in our erythrocytes, and invades our endothelial cells that carry several hundred viral particles per bacteria. We have no idea whether that's of any clinical significance or not. But some of the people where we can no longer document the organism have not gotten well. In most instances, they've not gotten well because we've not gotten rid of the organism. We can still find it. And then finally, co-infections, and this is again one of the more recent papers that uh, Bill alluded to out of our laboratory. We've got one more nightmare scenario going on at this point in time that's cost a lot of money without any funding. And in this instance, I went to Grenada to be on a committee for a graduate student, and within 24 hours of being there, they told me about a young veterinarian, 27 years old, that had graduated a couple years ago that started seizuring and at that point in time uh, had continued to seizure status epilepticus in a very long history that's described here. 
she was co-infected with two organisms that have never been described in a human before, Anaplasma platus, which is a very well known, as Dr. Stitch alluded to, organism that infects dogs, and Canadatus mycoplasma hematoparvum. Both of these are probably brown dog tick transmitted amongst dogs. Six months of doxycycline was administered, and she's still PCR positive. So my, my title for this talk essentially is a one health approach to emerging infectious diseases. And many of you in the audience are familiar with this particular citation from science. I really think that veterinarians, physicians, entomologists, parasitologists, and environmentalists, we really need to work together as we look at, at diseases. Um, I do believe, and I tell my profession, that bartonellosis is probably the most important contemporary in zoonotic infectious disease problem that we're going to have to sort out and deal with in the next several decades. And I base that on the fact that we've got a large number of species now exceeding 36. We've got a large number of reservoirs, some of which sleep on your bid. And we've got an increasing number of vectors, including ants recently reported from Australia and spider bites recently reported by us at a Kentucky. With that, I really, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, sir, it's Pervitra, impregnated uniforms, and that's, I can assure you that it's been thoroughly tested for years and years and years. And I'm really sort of adjunct to those committees, I don't have the data in mind, but you know, there was, the Army does not want, um, Losses, or, you know, so they've been they've been very dodgy of requiring that this be the mandatory uniform worn 24 seven. And I'm just wondering, in children, is there any evidence of toxicity? I think we're fine with that too. I know that the um, insect shield company sells onesies for babies and pregnant for babies. So this has been tested. I suppose there's always, um, you know, reason to suspect whatever, and different people react differently. But for me, it has been around for decades. And what I like to say is we've got a Lyme disease association for people who suffer from grow or door fry infection, but we don't have a for me, for disease association. You know, it's, the evidence just isn't coming to us. Okay. Hi. Um, first, this, this question is um, first, I would like to just say thank you for all your scientific contributions to the field of art now. Um, and my question, um, I, I just want to put it into context, my question a little bit before I ask it. I'm interested in um, resistant and relapsed Bartonella. Um, I, I personally have two strains of Bartonella, and um, one of them is a rare strain called Bartonella dossier that I don't think he's been found in humans before myself. Um, and Bartonella Hensley. And um, over the past three years, I've had six tests, three of them at Galaxy for Bartonella, and all six tests over the three years have always been positive. So, my question is in regards to your article that you wrote in 2010 in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology. Um, it was on Bartonella and Mycoplasma in a veterinarian from Texas who had relapsed in Bartonella over a five-year period, and then later was found to have mycoplasma in his archived blood samples. My question is, are you finding any more evidence um, that the combination of Bartonella and mycoplasma 
makes treatment of Bartonella more resistant and has a higher incidence than of relapse rates. And I know you can't comment on humans, but is there a combination of antibiotics that would be most effective in your dogs when you're treating <laughs> Bartonella and mycoplasma? better probably with the first one than the second one. We do, within the last year, um, a, a number of people in the lab have taken the Mosiani, what we refer to in the laboratory as the Mosiani subset of samples and the veterinary subset of samples. So that's about 600 in the two groups. And we've PCR'd all of them with a novel target for hematrophic mycoplasma that seems to be better than what we've done with 16S. PCR in the past. And so we've actually used the old PCR that's been used by everybody plus the new PCR. And there's not, we didn't find a lot of hematrophic mycoplasma in either population. So I don't think hematrophic mycoplasmas are very prevalent in humans. And again, nice part about veterinarians, they're at high risk because sheep have theirs, swine have theirs, dogs have theirs, cats have theirs. Um, and but interestingly enough, the mycoplasma that we found most consistently in both populations is the ovus, and we don't know why. So mycoplasma ovus. Um, so, so I don't think that's a factor in treatment. So this, the second question was, when I lecture almost to any audience in which I address treatment, I basically say we do not know how to treat this infection, period. Um, and, and I base that on the fact that the veterinarian that you refer to, I met at a national meeting in a wheelchair. He was already had a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. He received other therapies such as IVIG in conjunction with um, his antibiotic therapy, but he was treated very aggressively with antibiotics for courses six months and nine months. The lab, every time we got samples from him, he was almost PCR positive. And every once in a while, we get a sample set in where we got negative results through the entire BACGM platform. The last time he was treated, we tested him at three months, six months, nine months, and he was negative after one year of doxycycline revamp. And when we did the one-year sample, he was positive again. And after that, he kind of had a bit of a relapse and deteriorated some. Um, so I, I think the challenge you know, it, it's, I hate being the bearer of bad news, but in the context of Bartonella, most of it's been bad news since we started trying to understand this bacteria. And one bad news is that phylogenetically, it's a cousin of Brucella, and all of us learned in medical school, veterinary school, that treating Brucella is very challenging, and eliminating it is something that we may never have accomplished. Okay. Thank you. Um, earlier, you had, you had a great big list of Bartonella bacteria, and in this big list is just a very vague section called ruminants. And in Minnesota, that's a heck of a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> and with hunting being such a big, big issue in Minnesota, I have the wild question of, is it at all in any conceivable way possible for a human from field dressing a deer, elk, or moose. So, Bartonella is in cattle, and particularly beef cattle in the United States. Um, the two or three studies that have been done, including one from my laboratory, 80% are bacteremic at any point you test them. So, cattle have clearly co evolved with flies that bite them, that carry the Bartonella bovis, that infect them. Um, sheep are infected with Bartonella malophagia, and I think it was one of Dr. Fallon's cases, or no, I think it was Ken's case. Um, in the historical cat scratch disease literature, Bartonella hensile as an atypical manifestation of disease is pericarditis. So in emerging infectious diseases, we actually had two isolates in our lab, in a Revco, from BACGM for about two years. It didn't match anything in GenBank, and they end up being 
a couple years later, a sheep Bartonella that's now called Bartonella melophagia, and that came out of a woman with pericarditis in Southern California who just happened to live on a farm that was a menagerie with sheep and every other movement I can probably name as a veterinarian. So, to deer, um, which haven't been looked at very well in the United States, but in other parts of the world, are carrying a Bartonella called Bartonella shamuensis. Um, so, to date, no ruminant Bartonella other than Melophagia has been reported in a human patient sample. But one of the things I would say is that we know that the back end platform that we've developed, because I'm a companion animal internist, has been optimized to detect those Bartonellas better that are in companion animals than the other 36 or 30 some species that are out there. So, you know, I, I, I would say that, you know, we need better mouse traps and better diagnostic tests, as many people in this audience have said before me today. So then further studies are needed. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, I hunt deer, and if the next time you field dress one, I would carry a pair of plastic gloves with me. Another question on Dr. Bradford. In your dogs that were symptomatic and you treated them and they appeared to be recovered and yet you found persistent organisms and relapses, have you done any studies with prolonged, ongoing treatment, indefinite, lifelong? I mean, is there a point at which you wait till they're symptomatic and you treat them? So, so that's a good question for which the answer is almost embarrassing. We've got much better data in my laboratory on sequentially following humans than we do on sequentially following dogs that have come through our teaching hospital or another veterinarian has referred the samples into us and we've done the testing. Um, the reality in veterinary medicine is we used to give one shot at these patients and especially as a tertiary referral center, follow up on almost everything we do is not as good as it should be. So the I've actually extrapolated more from how the physicians have treated their patients to go back to how we have treated the dogs. And although we've seen a couple of treatment failures where we've gone back and retreated, we didn't know whether those dogs were re-exposed or actually persistently infected. Yes, um, I have a question about this. This question is for uh, Ms. Stoma. Um, I was very interested in the information that you were providing, and I'm glad to. I, I, scribbled down the, the website because I want to go look more closely at that. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me, I, I'm from Northern California, and uh, among other things that I do, I help run a, a blind support group in Sacramento. And uh, over about five years, uh, initially it seemed like most of the people that came to me were um, middle-aged women. But in the last year, I've been getting a, young, a lot of young men that are recently out of the military. And um, one case in particular, unfortunately, he recently passed away. He was bitten by a tick and got a bullseye rash at uh, one, of the, uh, one of the places in the Midwest. Uh, one of the places, I don't remember which one. He was during the basic training. And he was told by military doctors that, you know, it was just, they just didn't do anything for him, and he was discharged. And, uh, and as I say, he subsequently passed away. Uh, but I got another young man that had come to me, and they were in the military, and they were bitten, you know, on a base or during training or whatever, and they basically don't get anything from military doctors. And I even, even not even concerned, oh, gee whiz, you were bitten by a tick in an area that our own people have have found is all of this stuff, and so I'm wondering about that disconnect. And I was also just going to mention that I have a, a few uh, <coughs> older gentlemen who have come too that have uh, maybe perhaps didn't get uh, been in the military, but are veterans, and so go to the military hospital and basically cannot get treated for Lyme disease at uh, the military hospitals in Northern California. And so it seems, I would just be interested in your um, you know, sort of your thoughts on that disconnect between this fabulous research that you're doing and how that fails to trickle down to the retail level of dealing with people that are sick and coming to military doctors. 
teacher, good question. Um, if you can, I mean, the the whole military is so vast that there's um, plenty of disconnect, <laughs> and that's exactly the problem. Our program is voluntary; it's not mandatory. And I feel like, um, if, if you remember, the, I showed it a couple times the map of the U.S. with the places we serve. For one thing, for some reason or another, we don't get very, very much participation from California. I think that maybe one of the main reasons is that we're on the East Coast and, and just better. Our program's better known over there. But as you say, this one, this one young fellow was from, was infected. It was with infected. But you don't remember where or what branch of the service or anything. It was it was the, the state of Missouri, but I don't remember. Uh, it just yeah. it's um, each uh, preventive medicine unit or medic or military medical treatment facility elects whether or not to participate in our program, which I, I hope saves lives. But then each doctor treats his individual patient. I don't think there's a real policy governing things. We have programs, but, you know, and, it just, and I'm, it seems like Marines don't care about ticks. The Navy and the Air Force care quite a bit. The Army cares, but some, some installations never send us ticks. It's not important. Yeah. It's, but it's, even if they don't send you ticks, I mean, it seems like it's clear from the information that you presented here that this is a, that this is a large problem, and it just seems like there should be a mechanism within the military to use information that one arm is getting to, to help other people. You know, things, things may improve a little bit. We we're finally gathering all the tick and mosquito infection data by year and publishing it, you know, accumulating stuff like that. But it's it's just the, the, the organic disconnect of a large um, organization where members rotate in and out of the service and they rotate geographically constantly, you know, it's just a disconnect from them. Thank you.